here is uh, Yolanda Gil, and uh, she's Spanish, and she has consequently no concept of time, so good luck to us. Um, I'm going to talk about Discover Informatics. It's a, it's a summary of discussions that we've been having for about a year in the um, artificial intelligence community, uh, very focused on uh, what can intelligent systems do for science innovation. Uh, so one uh, theme in our discussions is that there's been a lot of focus on data. And of course data is very important and we need to pay attention to it. But from our point of view, we're not emphasizing so much is the process of collecting or the process of analyzing data or the process of understanding data. And there's a lot of processes in science that we really have to um, pay attention to because it's important to realize that um, they, they're, um, they form an integral part of how science is practiced. So science is not just about data. So I show here a, a, one of the uh, highlights from a survey that science did with their reviewers uh, published last year. And they asked if they had the necessary expertise in their lab to analyze the data that they had. And you can see that um, the majority did not. Either they seek collaborators to do this, or they just don't have a way to uh, take advantage of all the data that they have. So this means that the data is there. It's the process of analyzing it. It's all the steps that are involved in understanding uh, the data that is um, a, a bottleneck and a problem. So there's a lot of aspects of the scientific process. It's not just analyzing data. It's first of all, what's the state of the art? What is known about X? What's a good problem to work on? What's a good experiment to design? What data should be collected? What's the best way to analyze it? What are the implications of the results of these experiments? And how can I revise current models? So all of these are processes that we do. And um, there's really a human bottleneck in addressing all these processes. They're, they're for the most part, you know, <coughs> manually carried out. So we think that um, in this community that artificial intelligence can be a, a game changer if we're able to combine human and machine intelligence in useful ways. So I'm going to give you um, uh, some high-level view of, of, of what that might mean and then some examples of systems that can illustrate this. Um, so this all started at an NSF-funded workshop um, where we discussed three aspects of helping scientists throughout those processes. Um, one topic focused on um, supporting uh, processes of discovery. So, for example, a data analysis process or uh, reading the literature. Those are processes where intelligent systems could, for example, read the literature or automate some aspect of data analysis. So it's very important that we understand what processes are in place and what are improvements or um, uh, ways in which we can assist scientists with those processes. Um, a second topic that we discussed is that a lot of uh, uh, systems and a lot of uh, science software uh, and infrastructure, the data is separate from the models. So the data is in some file or the data is in some repository, but the models that we build are either uh, computer programs or uh, the models are published in a paper described in a set of equations any which way, but there's no computing infrastructure that links the data to the models and has a way to revise the models based on data or understands that a certain data set actually contradicts a model. So there's no link between the two. And so uh, there's a lot of machine learning systems or data mining systems that discover things, but there's no link back to uh, how to refine the data collection, for example. So it's this interplay between data and models that um, we discussed should be more emphasized. And the third topic we discussed is the idea of using social computing infrastructure for discovery. Uh, so there's a lot of examples now of um, uh, systems that use citizen science to help scientists do a variety of things. Um, you may have heard of Galaxy Zoo, where, uh, where uh, volunteer uh, contributors, not amateur astronomers at all, but just uh, normal citizens, uh, have labeled thousands uh, and millions, actually millions, of uh, galaxy images. Uh, there's uh, one uh, system called Folded, where contributors go and uh, they form teams and they play games to propose 
possible protein foldings. Uh, and they're trying to optimize the folding to win the game against the other competitors, and then they rearrange themselves to form better teams. So they're basically forming an optimal human intelligence to tackle these problems, and their folds uh, that they've come up with are better than the best algorithms available uh, that the scientists had developed. So being able to support these three aspects actually uh, involves a lot of techniques uh, and a lot of research in artificial intelligence um, in all sides that are highlighted in the outskirts of this. Uh, there's a detailed report on this website, if you search for it, um, that you can see. So I'll give you some examples of the kinds of artificial intelligence systems that we think are um, uh, helpful. Um, so in the process of understanding the literature, you may be looking for uh, everything that is known about a certain gene or a certain protein or a certain type of um, object. So um, this is an example of a system that uh, does machine reading or text extraction where it's identifying entities in text, it's uh, relating them to one another, and it's integrating what it, it extracts from PubMed publications together with curated databases of facts, um, for example, organism databases or others, and it's actually doing a bit of inference to suggest possible connections uh, between the biological entities. Um, so this is the kind of uh, system that you can imagine supporting uh, a lot of questions that you may have about what is known about X in the literature. Um, this is an example from Hodgson uh, from Cornell, um, where he's using uh, feature-free algorithms to actually mine data, and in the process, he's keeping uh, models, so data that comes from experiments. Uh, the system is generating models, and it's actually thinking about which models it should text, uh, test next. Uh, based on that, it selects certain experiments, designs the experiments, and then um, he's connecting the system to actual um, uh, machines, experiment machines that can collect additional data and then go back and revise the models. He actually uses this entire cycle uh, with robots. So you have a robot that has a very strange body shape, has you know, one short leg, two very long legs, and the robot lear learns to walk based on this idea of generating models and revising them that it does. So I think that this kind of exploration of uh, being able to, to do this um, automatic um, uh, experiment design um, can help in a lot of uh, exploration of phenomena. Um, my own work, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, is on uh, improving uh, the data analysis processes that, that uh, scientists do. So there's a lot of reasons for this. One is that uh, there's actually a lot of cost to uh, preparing data just to run models. So this is uh, an example uh, from Earth Sciences that 60% of their time uh, of the time is spent preparing data to run a model, and then 40% uh, of the time is actually done using uh, doing science. And uh, the proportion is uh, much worse, according to a lot of sources. A lot of people talk about 80/20, right? You spend 80% of the time getting data from NASA satellites and your own sensors, and then 20% of the time you actually got all the data ready, and 20% of the time you actually do the work. Um, the quality, so so this is a quote from um, a survey that we took with scientists in geosciences, and uh, they talk about quality control. So we do the quality control because we know it's needed, but we're probably not doing it the best way. And I know that there's colleagues of mine that do it really well. Can I reuse their methods? Um, also, the methods could be more efficient. So, so this is another quote from another survey where they're saying, you know, I know that I'm doing the same thing that a hundred other people out there are doing, and it's taking me months. Can I just, you know, can we just share all this, um, all this uh, analytics? Uh, and then finally, making your analysis inspectable and reproducible. And I think that we've heard about this. Um, I'm showing here on the right some work that we've done with uh, Phil Bourne. He mentioned it yesterday, where it took us two months of effort to actually reproduce uh, a, a, a workflow, a, a set of steps, analytic steps that they had published last year. And the, the expertise from the author side was required. And I think that there's a lot of um, papers that I can point to that actually do studies of the literature and find that this is commonplace. What we're trying to do here is quantify the effort. Why are we spending all this effort uh, trying to redo others' methods? And moreover, many people just don't redo them and have to invent their own because it's very hard and costly to redo. Um, so this is an example of what you might envision the 
these uh, intelligent systems doing. This is a library of workflows from population genomics. And what we did is uh, take a workflow that did association, took the data from a paper that did an association study, and just run that data through our workflow. And we got a significance in the same area of the gene. Uh, same thing with a paper about copy number analysis. We took a copy number variation detection, run the workflow, much more modern. The authors were using proprietary software, older methods, but we actually got significance in the same area. So you can imagine an automated, or automated um, generator of uh, significant areas in the gene uh, based on running these workflows on data sources. How could we make that vision happen? Uh, and this is an example of a workflow system actually automatically uh, selecting um, and configuring the workflow, setting up parameters and setting up models uh, based on what the data looks like. Um, and this is on a water uh, resource uh, framework where, depending on the flow of the water, different models are appropriate in the system is uh, doing this automatically every 24 hours. So this is my last slide, just summarizing that discovery informatics is about intelligence systems that might complement human intelligence uh, to improve the scientific processes. There's a lot of potential areas that might be high payoff, and I think that the topics that we're discussing in this meeting uh, might benefit from this. So that's all I have. And our next, uh, our next speaker, uh, speaker is uh, Tim Clark.